this time of year being uh, just after the conclusion of the hunting season uh, puts me in mind of an anecdote I heard uh, not long ago. That up in northern Ontario, there was an operator of a hunting camp, a commercial operator, and uh, he uh, would put hunters up, provide them accommodation and food, and also hunting equipment, including dogs. And a world-famous hunter who had hunted around the world arrived one time, and uh, uh, he was given a hunting dog uh, as part of the package, and out he went. And he came back. He was raving about the ability of this dog, uh, whose uh, name happened to be Lawyer. And he said that this was, and he said, I've been around the world, hunted game everywhere and every kind of game, and he said, this is without a doubt the best hunting dog I've ever come across. And he said, I'll come back next year on the sole condition that lawyer will be available as my dog. And the operator said, fine, that's, uh, that's okay, come on back. And the next year he arrived, and the morning came, he was going to set out hunting, and they gave him a dog. And he said, that's not a lawyer. He said, I uh, came on the condition that I would have lawyer. And uh, the operator said, oh, sir, he said, I can't, uh, I can't let you have lawyer. I, I, I just can't. And he said, well, you agreed you would, and you've got to give it to me. And he said, no. He said, he's, he's uh, no longer a good dog. He said, what do you mean he's no longer a good dog? Well, he says it's a sort of a sad story, but... He said, just after you were here last year, the next week somebody came and he said, this, this dog has been a lawyer too long and uh, I'm going to, we'll change his name to Judge. And he said they did and they started to call him Judge and ever since that all he'll do is sit in his ass and growl. I have uh, been asked to speak to you this evening on the uh, topic of privilege. Now, fortunately for you and me both, uh, the subject has been uh, restricted so that I'm only to discuss the doctrine of privilege insofar as it relates to the communications between uh, solicitors and their clients and that privilege uh, that relates to communications between spouses. I will uh, discuss those two uh, topics separately after making some general remarks about uh, privilege. Before doing so, I think I ought to publicly acknowledge my indebtedness to uh, Brian Greenspan and David Watt for making available uh, to me recent lectures which they gave on these subjects and authorizing me to make substantial use of their material in the preparation of the remarks that I am going to make this evening. Now privilege is an exception to any person's duty to testify completely as to that person's knowledge of the issues which are invest under investigation by a judicial tribunal. Obviously, the job of the courts is to ascertain the truth. And to that end, subject, of course, to the many exceptions that are found in our law of evidence, the prime and fundamental principle of admissibility is relevant, is relevant. If a piece of evidence is relevant to the issue, then obviously it's admissible and should be told. follows that, as a necessary corollary to that, that any information which any person has of the issues uh, should be put before the court. Now, clearly, society has a very substantial interest in seeing to it that the truth is ascertained in its courts. Privilege is a strange doctrine, doctrine in many ways, and it seems to arise out of considerations of policy whereby it has been determined that there are certain interests which are paramount 
to the interest of seeing to it that truth is determined in the courts. Privilege is an exception to the obligation upon a witness to testify completely about the knowledge or information that that person has about the issues. Now, really, privilege is not intended to aid a particular litigant or a particular party to the litigation. Litigation, uh, privilege is there for the overall public good. And privilege very often amounts to an obstacle to the ascertainment of truth. And the obstacle can only be suffered if judicial policy has deemed certain other interests paramount to that of ascertaining the facts in an individual case. I intend to touch on certain cases that deal with the privilege that exists between solicitor and client respecting their communications with one another. There are a fair number of uh, cases referred to in the paper which you'll eventually get. It's in its, I think if my secretary has it, it's in a, I hope it's final form and it'll get to uh, the uh, people who put out the materials in due course so that you'll get it. And I may mention some cases, I won't give you any citations, and uh, sometimes I will not go through cases that support certain uh, principles. Now, I intend to discuss solicitor-client privilege only in so far as it relates to the communication between solicitor and client. There is another privilege that sometimes is loosely called solicitor-client privilege, but I don't think it is, and that's the privilege that attaches to communications in an attempt to settle a contested dispute. Uh, I don't think that that is truly solicitor-client privilege. That type of privilege arises out of the policy consideration that it's advantageous to have parties attempt to resolve a dispute without going through the trial process. I would, uh, if you want to do some research on, on that part of privilege, there's an interesting uh, uh, several pages in Sapinka and Letterman. Uh, pages are set out in the paper. Now the privilege accorded to the communication between solicitor and client goes back into the hundreds of years, at least three or four hundred years. I don't think it's necessary for anybody's purpose that the history of that privilege be reviewed. It is clearly well established. I don't know. I've been accused of being somewhat cynical, but I'll leave it to you to, uh, or at least those of you who are cynical, uh, to wonder why such privilege exists between solicitor and client while none seems to exist between professional advisors and other fields of activity and those to who, who come to them for advice or assistance. For those of you who are very cynical, you may think that there is some relationship between the, there's some uh, the relationship between the fact that the judges who propounded this privilege were at one time members of the legal profession themselves. I uh, don't know whether hundreds of years ago a little professional back scratching went on, but uh, the so-called justification for the privilege being granted to communications between solicitor and client must be based upon the assumption that full and frank disclosure between a client and his solicitor is necessary to proper legal advice <coughs> and proper legal representation. There are many articulate expressions of the rationale for privilege. The one to which I make reference is that of uh, a former Chief Justice of the High Court, Mr. McCrure, in his report of the findings in his Royal Commission inquiry into civil rights in Ontario. But you'll find that set out there, and there are many other 
uh, high-sounding phrases that um, put the legal justification under the privilege that we've all lived with in our practices. Uh, like many other principles, the principle of solicitor-client privilege is not too difficult to state, but it can often be fairly difficult to apply. In the recent cases, of course, where it comes up are the interception of communications, whether by uh, opening mail, uh, listening on wiretaps, uh, any other method, and I suppose as we get more sophisticated in our uh, communications uh, equipment, that there'll be many ways to by which the communication can be overheard. I think when you have specific problems, it, I've found, and very often, the best thing to do is just go back to basic fundamental principles and then try to apply them to particular sets of circumstances. Now, in the early stages of the development of the common law privilege, it was necessary that the communication between a solicitor and client be in contemplation of anticipated litigation or in preparation of ongoing litigation. However, the rule has been substantially uh, broadened within the last hundred years to include information acquired during confidential communications in a professional capacity. Problems can arise in determining whether in fact the communication is one uh, between a client and the solicitor as solicitor. As you all know, many times solicitors are on, uh, are officers of corporations, or they do other work that they don't have to be solicitors to be doing that work. It is essential to keep in mind that the principle of privilege only applies when the solicitor and client are doing real legal business. That is the business of solicitor advising in legal matters. If counsel is consulted in counsel's capacity as an officer of a corporation or a trustee of a uh, trust fund or in any other capacity, or consulted to give biz <coughs> business advice as, as contrasted with legal advice, I don't think the privilege will attach. Among the cases that you'll see on this is a case of Regina and Maunder. It's about 15 years old now. And you, wonder, you might wonder why I put it in, because if you take the time to read the case, you'll see it's one of my losers. Uh, case is interesting for another point, and I, I think it's worth remembering it. If uh, you ever have to cons consider the problem of the evidentiary effect of documents found in the possession of an accused, the Maunder case has a very interesting statement of the law. Uh, if you take a look at the case, uh, you'll find that uh, the prosecutor was the present Judge Arthur Whaley, and those of you who practice with him in Toronto might be a little surprised to know that at one time he was a very vigorous federal prosecutor. And uh, he had the ultimate compliment paid to him because the trial judge in the Maunder case gave back verbatim as his ruling on the legal issue about the effect of these documents Arthur Whaley's argument to him, which he had submitted in writing. And uh, it was high praise indeed. Now, a logical extension of the uh, privilege is that it extends to not only to the lawyer at, 
his or herself, but to uh, people employed doing the work. And uh, the privilege does extend to secretaries, clerks, paralegals, and those persons to whom it is necessary in the running of a law office to disclose certain, uh, certain matters. Another issue, and there are some cases on this, uh, is whether the person consulted is in fact a solicitor. Uh, there was a case some years ago that the l person consulted for legal advice was a lawyer but not authorized to practice in the particular jurisdiction. Uh, and it was held in, in the Mammoth Oil case that uh, that person was not a solicitor. I think you'll find more recent authority in this day and age of multinationals will have some uh, considerable amelioration of that stricture. Now, an important aspect of privilege and another of the hallmarks of it is confidentiality and there is a responsibility on the parties to the communication to uh, protect the confidentiality. Now, there is a very tricky problem, and it may be more of an ethical one for you than strictly legal, but the position that counsel is in when a client gives certain information, privilege obviously doesn't apply when the solicitor is a co-conspirator or a party to the offense. Uh, communication uh, between one accused and another who happens to be a solicitor can't be privileged. Can't be privileged if it's tainted by fraud or criminality. Uh, a partner of mine many years ago had fascinating experience occur. He was sitting in his office, it was in the summer day about one o'clock. Most of the other people, the lawyers in the office had gone out. Switchboard bu buzzed him to say that a Mrs. X, who was known to him, she was a client of his, and also the wife of a client who was a fairly well-known bank robber, and said Mrs. X was outside and wanted to see him. Mrs. X was sent in, she was carrying an attache case. And she put it on his desk and said, John wants you to keep that for him. He said, well, what is it? She opened it and was full of money. And he said, well, what's this all about? She said, have you been listening to the news? <laughs> and she said, he said, no. Uh, he hadn't. And she said, well, why don't you turn on the 1 o'clock news? He had a radio in his office. So he turned it on. And there had been a holdup at a local bank between 11.30 and 12 that morning, and the report was that the bandits were seen heading in a certain direction, a particular car. Well, obviously, uh, here were the fruits of the robbery in his office, and uh, great scurrying around, I asked various learned counsel what ought to be done in the circumstances. I can tell you the result of it, and, and the real issue never had to come out because uh, the Crown got such good evidence anyway, they didn't need it. But what was done, he called the police and said, uh, I want you to come into my office. I have something I want to turn over to you, and I have nothing to say about it, but I want to give it to you. So the police came up and uh, had turned over to them the fruits of the robbery, and I think they were able to trace it very quickly to coming from this particular robbery. But... Uh, the lawyer didn't have to go and testify, and we didn't have the benefit of, of a, um, a ruling on that. Uh, now, I propose to skip through uh, a fair bit of this because I'm, I keep looking at my watch. Uh, are there certain obvious 
exceptions to solicitor client. This probably won't interest uh, solicitor client privilege. This probably won't interest you being interested in criminal cases, but it's been held in a number of cases that the instructions given by a testator to his solicitor are not privileged if a dispute arises uh, after the death of the testator as to whether he had testamentary capacity and very important inquiry into the testamentary capacity is to inquire into the instructions given by the deceased to the solicitor. Now, the case of um, interception of communications in writing between solicitor and client has recently been considered by the Supreme Court of Canada in the Solosky case. Uh, and there, certain letters from a prisoner uh, were intercepted. And the judgment deals with the competing interests of security in a penal institution and the right of the uh, client to confidential uh, assistance from his solicitor. I just refer you to that case if you get into that problem. But there are two competing uh, important principles involved. There is a, a terribly difficult problem of protecting privilege of documents when a seizure is made in a law office. Uh, as you know, in the Income Tax Act, there is a procedure whereby such documents are, uh, are secured then they're brought before a, a judge of the, uh, who examines them and rules whether, whether they are privileged or whether they aren't. If they're privileged, they're directed to be returned to the client. If they are uh, ruled not to be privileged, then they are uh, available for the Crown or for the income tax authorities. There is no similar, there's yet no similar uh, provision in the criminal code. So if police march into a solicitor's office and sees the documents belong to a particular client, uh, there's a difficult problem. Uh, it may ultimately be that the court will rule that the documents were privileged, but the police can get at them and, and, and look at them, and there might be a lot of uh, derivative evidence that can be found or other evidence that can be found by making reference to these documents. In the case of uh, Borden and Elliot and the Queen, uh, a procedure on consent was adopted whereby the uh, uh, parties ag agreed to follow a procedure not dissimilar to that under the Income Tax Act. The Provincial Offenses Act uh, uh, has a similar procedure to, to that of the Income Tax Act. Now, there is uh, no doubt that uh, a privileged communication intercepted by a wiretap uh, is inadmissible, and usually now the wiretap author authorizations will require that the machine be shut down while any solicitor client intercept is, uh, or, or communication is intercepted. They get a tap on somebody's line and person legitimately calls a solicitor for advice, uh, obviously uh, that <coughs> can't be admitted, but there, there is uh, uh, a grave difficulty, a grave practical difficulty in uh, policing that kind of thing. I don't know that uh, the tape may be turned off, but whether people stop listening, I don't know. Uh, 
there really is no privilege for any other professional but solicitors. Uh, there is no uh, privilege uh, between doctors and patients, uh, social workers and clients, uh, clergy and penitents. Uh, there is a case, you might want to take a look at a, a, a Supreme Court of Canada case that may be starting a trend to expand privilege. It certainly doesn't, but it, it, it may be an opening and it's set out. It's the uh, Slavucic and Baker Collier. It's a case involving a tenure application at the University of Alberta. Interestingly enough, there have been a number of cases recently uh, where journalists and uh, members of the legislature have uh, maintained that they're entitled to privilege between the, the communications with their confidential sources of information, you know, the, uh, the deep throats. And whether uh, there's privilege for deep throats or not, I think the courts uh, will find most any way they can to get out of holding a newspaper person in contempt. Now, I want to move on to just say a few words about husband and wife communication privilege. At one time, it was thought that a communication between a husband and wife during marriage was, in fact, uh, privileged. No less a, an authority than Dean Wigmore was of that opinion, and you'll find it uh, so stated in, uh, in volume eight of Wigmore, and the citation is set out. The English courts, the House of Lords, and the uh, Court of Appeal in both civil and criminal cases have said that no privilege ever existed. It's, judges are weird and wonderful people. I uh, have heard them described recently as mind readers because they read the mind of the legislature or parliament and determine what was in the mind of the legislature at the time they said certain things. And in these cases, they said that this privilege just never existed. It's, uh, that examined all the cases and a lot of the authorities that seem to say that such privilege did exist, but they've come to the conclusion, I think, the decisions would be followed in our courts. So any privilege re between spouses, I think you have to find in the statute. There is uh, a rather lengthy uh, section, it's section four of the Canada Evidence Act, which sets out uh, certain types of privilege. But you have to look at those sections very carefully. The Ontario uh, Evidence Act has a, has a very brief section that a husband is not compellable to disclose any communication made to him by his wife during marriage, nor to her uh, by her husband during marriage. Uh, I've made some comments in, uh, in there about some, really they're just thinking out loud comments and I, they're not worth very much by way of authority, but some ideas I had about the effect of those sections. I think what is very important and an interesting conflict in appellate decisions that may be resolved in the Supreme Court of Canada before very long. As you know, in the wiretap uh, section, the, there is a provision that any information obtained by an interception, that but for the interception would have been privileged, remains privileged and inadmissible as evidence without the consent of the person enjoying the privilege. Now how that relates to spousal communications is this. The section says that any privileged statement remains or any privileged uh, communication remains privileged. But if the communication simply isn't privileged, and if the English cases are right, that there is no privilege, basically, between the 
a communication between husband and wife, then this section doesn't seem to help. So if a wiretap picks up uh, a communication between a husband and wife in which one of them makes uh, very serious uh, admissions of guilt or some such very important evidence, I kind of doubt that this section will keep it out. Now the two cases that are conflicting are decisions of the Alberta Supreme uh, Appellate Division and the um, British Columbia uh, Court of Appeal. Uh, the Alberta case, ha what had happened, a spousal communication had been picked up on an intercept. The Alberta Court of Appeal uh, held that the communication was inadmissible. The British Columbia Court of Appeal held that the communication was not privileged, and that section does not create any new privilege, uh, so therefore it was uh, inadmissible. I I'm sorry, therefore it was admissible. The uh, Alberta case went to the Supreme Court of Canada, and the, the issue was left open. I'm told that the uh, British Columbia case is on its way to the Supreme Court of Canada, or is there. It'll be interesting to uh, see how they come out. There is one case, if I can turn it up, uh, and it's about section four, uh, subsection four of the Canada Evidence Act, and that's the section that gives, uh, in fact of that is that there are certain sections that a spouse can't uh, testify without the consent of the accused spouse. There have been exceptions. The exception usually was if the offense was against the spouse, spouse's health or uh, property. Uh, there have been attempts to expand that principle, and a case I commend to you is one of Judge Boren's, and it's McNamara decided a couple of years ago, where he extends the uh, right of a spouse to testify when the injury was not done to the spouse herself, but to one of the children. And I commend that case to you as a very scholarly and articulate examination of that uh, fundamental uh, problem of when a spouse can be permitted to testify against uh, the spouse. And it is, I think, it's a, a proper uh, enlargement of the scope of those that the spouse uh, can or the circumstances in which a spouse can testify against a spouse. And uh, if you have to do some research and, and um, deal with that problem, I commend the McNamara case to you. By my watch and the clock on the wall, you've had enough. Thank you. Thank you.